Today's lesson is about special parallelograms. We've already talked about properties of parallelograms in general for any kind of parallelogram, but there are some special parallelograms that we need to discuss. So first one being a rectangle. We've already talked about the fact that a rectangle is a parallelogram, but the definition doesn't actually say anything about it being a parallelogram. What it says is that a rectangle is a quadrilateral. It means you, all you know is you got four sides. But it's a quadrilateral with four right angles. So if you have a, a four-sided figure, all four angles are right angles, you know for sure that you have a rectangle. Okay. So then as we read through these theorems, you got to pay attention to the fact that whether it says if it's just a quadrilateral or if it's a parallelogram already and you know that or whatever. But here it says if a quadrilateral is a rectangle. So I know that I have a rectangle. If you know that, then it is a parallelogram. So let's talk about how we know that for sure. So if we have, here is a rectangle. It's a quadrilateral, four right angles. Okay, that's the definition of a rectangle. Because of that, then both pair of opposite angles are congruent, or you could say one angle is supplementary to both of its consecutive angles that would make it a parallelogram. If we didn't have this theorem, then we would have to actually state that the opposite angles are congruent or whatever and then get there through another theorem. But with this, we can go directly there. And so to abbreviate it, you can say if it is a rectangle, then it is a parallelogram. So the, the reason that this is important is because it tells us then that a rectangle has all of the properties that a parallelogram does. So. A, B, C, D is a parallelogram. That means we know for rectangles, opposite sides are congruent, opposite sides are parallel, opposite angles are congruent, the diagonals bisect each other, all that kind of stuff. All right, so then look at the next one. This now says if a parallelogram, so we know it's a parallelogram, is a rectangle, so it's a rectangle, which means it has to be a parallelogram, then its diagonals, and we already know that the diagonals bisect each other. So let's think about what's happening here. If I know that the diagonals bisect each other, those are congruent, those are congruent. And let's call this point E so that we can talk about that. Then let's think about what happens here. The diagonals, oh, sorry. The diagonals bisect each other because it's a parallelogram, so we know that. So then if I look at this diagonal being part of this right triangle right here, here's what we know. We know that that's a right triangle and side length C inside length D, right, at this right angle. Oh, goodness, sorry. I'm on the board there. Undo that. Come on, come on. All right. And then we have this right triangle right here. These two right triangles have to be congruent because if it's a if it's a rectangle, it's a parallelogram, which means the opposite sides are congruent. So BA is congruent to CD, AD is congruent to itself. These are both right angles, so these triangles are congruent by side angle side. So since the triangles are congruent, that means the hypotenuse is congruent. So not only do the diagonals bisect each other because it's a parallelogram, they are also congruent because of congruent triangles. And I want you to look at that rectangle, and I want you to think about how many triangles are actually there. There's actually eight triangles there. There are these four, right? There are these two we just talked about, and then there's two here that are upside down. So there's a total of eight triangles in there. The right triangles you get are congruent to each other. So here's what's important. Those are congruent, which means the diagonals are congruent. Since the diagonals are congruent and they bisect each other, 
That means that all four of the little pieces are congruent to each other. So that tells us yet another thing. The bigger triangles are right triangles, but the smaller triangles, think about what kind of triangles those are. Those are isosceles triangles. And if you lose sight of the fact that you have isosceles triangles in a rectangle, that is going to get you stuck on some things. So all four of the little triangles, not necessarily congruent, but all four of them are isosceles triangles. These diagonals do not necessarily bisect those angles, so don't go there. But these two are congruent, and these two triangles are congruent for sure. And all four of those are little isosceles triangles, so make sure you don't lose sight of that. So to abbreviate this, we're going to say if it's a rectangle, then the diagonals are congruent. So remember this, if it's a rectangle, the diagonals also bisect each other, but that's actually a parallelogram property because the rectangle has all of the parallelogram properties plus a couple more. So these two are specific to rectangles. The other properties that a rectangle have, they have them because they live in the parallelogram family. Okay. So what we know, what this tells us is that line segment BD is congruent to line segment AC. In addition to that, the important part that we have is because they're congruent and because it's a parallelogram and they bisect each other, we know that line segment BE is also congruent to ED, which is congruent to AE, which is congruent to EC, because all four little pieces are congruent to each other. That was not necessarily true in a just a regular old parallelogram. All right, so next up we have a rhombus. You should already know what a rhombus is and what it looks like. The actual definition of a rhombus, a rhombus is a quadrilateral. So I know it have, has four sides, it's a quadrilateral. To what makes a rhombus a rhombus is four congruent sides. Four congruent sides. So our first theorem says if a quadrilateral is a rhombus. So all I know, I got a four-sided figure because the sides are congruent, that makes it a rhombus. If it is a rhombus, then it is a parallelogram. Because if our, all four sides are congruent, then opposite sides have to be congruent. And we had a theorem yesterday that said if a quadrilateral has both pair of opposite sides congruent, then it is a parallelogram. So that means a rhombus has to be a parallelogram. So to abbreviate this, we can say if it is a rhombus, then it is a parallelogram. So our conclusion here is just that ABCD is a parallelogram. All right, so if a parallelogram is a rhombus, then it's blank. All right, so what's asking, or what we're talking about here are the diagonals. Now, we know that the diagonals bisect each other. That's not a rhombus property, because it says if a parallelogram is a rhombus, the fact that they bisect each other is for every parallelogram ever. Specifically for a rhombus, it gets a little bit different. So we know that they bisect each other already. So let's talk about the fact that they bisect each other and what this could possibly lead us to. So they bisect each other. What else could be true? Maybe they're congruent. Maybe they're not. Um, if they were, I would think we would kind of put it together with a rectangle. And remember, if you think of a really uh, drastic example and it's like really squished, then you could tell that there's no way it could be that they are congruent. But I want you to look at this triangle here. That triangle is what kind of triangle? It is an isosceles triangle. And this diagonal right here goes to the midpoint of that side. So if you remember that if this comes through and it divides or it bisects the side, the third side of an isosceles triangle, that means it has to be perpendicular to it. Because if a point is equidistant from two endpoints of a segment, 
then it lives on the perpendicular bisector. Since this is a bisector, it has to be the perpendicular bisector. So what that tells us is that for a rhombus, the diagonals are perpendicular. Okay. All four little pieces, not necessarily congruent, because we didn't say anything about the diagonals being congruent, just that they are perpendicular. Okay. So to, we can say over here that line segment BD is perpendicular to line segment AC, and that if it's a rhombus, then the diagonals are perpendicular. Okay. So think about in this one, would that mean that all, like I know in a parallelogram that these two triangles would be congruent and these two triangles would be congruent. In a rhombus, would that make all four triangles here be congruent? I think that we could prove that those four triangles are congruent very easily. We could use side angle side with the right angle if we wanted to, because if that is a right angle, all four of them are, obviously. Um, or you could look at side, side, side for the little triangles. But in a rhombus, all four of these little triangles are congruent. So that's an important thing for us to notice. That's going to help us with this next one. Because the next one says, if a parallelogram is a rhombus, so if a parallelogram is a rhombus, then each diagonal blank a pair of opposite angles. Well, we've just said that we know that the four little triangles are congruent, right? We know that this is a right angle. Okay. My computer's freezing up. I'm not even sure I can pause the video. Oh, there we go. All right, so. We know for sure that this is a right angle, right? And we know that all these little triangles are congruent. So that would mean that this angle right here, because if you look at this right here also, this isosceles triangle, since this gets bisected, these two triangles are congruent. So it's these two angles here that are congruent, and these two angles here that are congruent, and then these two and these two. So we already know for a parallelogram that the opposite angles, this big angle, is congruent to this big angle. But in addition to that, in a rhombus, the, the angles get bisected by the diagonals. That does not happen in every parallelogram. It happens in a rhombus. So the diagonals bisect a pair of opposite angles. So that means that we can abbreviate this as, if it is a rhombus, then the diagonals bisect opposite angles. So that is true for a rhombus, not necessarily true for a rectangle, not necessarily true for a just a normal parallelogram. So we know here then that angle 1 is congruent to angle 2, which is also congruent to angle 5 which is also congruent to angle 6. And we know that angle 3 is congruent to angle 4, which is congruent to angle 7, which is congruent to angle 8. So remember, these three things right here are in addition to all of the other properties that a rhombus has because it's a parallelogram. So all the parallelogram properties apply, plus these three here that are specific for a rhombus. Okay, so when you talk about diagonals being perpendicular, make sure you can tell me if that's true because it's a rhombus property or a parallelogram property. Okay, all right, so let's turn the page. Let's talk about a square. A square is a quadrilateral with four right angles and four congruent sides. A square is a rhombus and a rectangle at the same time, okay? And because a rhombus and a rectangle are parallelograms, that means a square is a parallelogram. So a square has all the properties of parallelograms rectangles 
and rhombi, which is just plural for rhombus. Okay, so a square has all of the above, basically. All right, let's see how we're going to apply these. This says a woodworker constructs a rectangular picture frame. So focusing on things here, we know it is a rectangle, rectangular picture frame, so that JK is 50 centimeters, JL is 86 centimeters. So this whole thing is 86 centimeters. I want to find HM, so I'm going to call this X. And state the theorem that supports your answer. So here's what we know. We know that JL is 86. Pretty sure that 50 is going to have nothing to do with it. I think it's pretty easy for you to come up with the number of what HM is, but remember, it's not all about just, bam, got the right answer. It's about how to explain yourself. And so you can't just tell me that the that x is 43 because you took half of 86. Well, how'd you know you could take half of 86? What are you using here? That the diagonals are congruent or that they got bisected or both? And in what order are you actually talking about these? So the first thing we can do, we got to get over to x. I know that km, the length of km, is equal to 86 centimeters. They did not tell me that. The reason I know that is that if it is a rectangle then the diagonals are congruent. I'm actually letting you skip a few steps there because that doesn't actually say congruence, that talks about equality. But we're skipping some steps, but that's in general how we knew that that would be okay there, okay? So then we know, because we know that, I know that the length of HM is 43 centimeters. And that has nothing to do with it being a rectangle. That's actually a parallelogram property. That's saying if it is a parallelogram, then the diagonals bisect each other. Okay, so there were two theorems that we had to use there to get that easy, easy answer. I know you can look at it and just know it, but remember, this is all about justifying it. How do you know what you know? Okay. All right, let's look at B. It says A, B, C, D is a rectangle. Find each length. State the theorem that supports your answer. So we're looking for BD, right? So this is a rectangle. Um, I'm looking for the length of BD first, right? And so if this is 6.5, this is 6.5. And I know that because the diagonals get bisected, think about is that a rectangle property or is that a parallelogram property? That's actually a parallelogram property. It's fine that it's a rectangle, but we just got to make sure we can answer this answer this correctly. So the answer is 13 inches because 6.5 and 6.5 is 13. There's nothing crazy hard about that. So my reason then is if it's a parallelogram, then the diagonals bisect each other. So I know these two pieces are congruent. Now I already know it's a rectangle, so this one gets bisected too, but they are congruent, so all four little pieces are the same. So now I'm looking for the length of CD. Well, the length of CD, this is 5 inches, this is going to be 5 inches. It's not crazy hard there, right? 5 inches. Does that have anything at all to, to do with the fact that it's a rectangle? The answer to that is no. It has to do with the fact that a rectangle is a parallelogram. So we say if it's a parallelogram, then both pair, or we say opposite sides congruent. Then the length of AC, right? Well, we already said that BD is 13, so AC is going to be 13 inches. Is that a rectangle property? And the answer to that is yes. It's because the diagonals are congruent. That's not a parallelogram property. This is if it's a rectangle, then diagonals are congruent. So then we're looking for AE, so AE is 6.5, because that's half of AC, because if it's a parallelogram, then diagonals bisect each other. 
There you go. So let's look at example two. On, on all of these examples, you can pause the video and try and figure them out on your own first or think about them. I'm just going to push right through, but you can always pause so you can think about it for a minute. It says RSTV is a rhombus. Find VT. So there's nothing on VT. I want to put a variable over here. I can't put X because there's already an X there. So I'll have to, I'll use a Y. We'll say VT is Y. So state the theorem that supports your answer. So this really should say state the theorem or definition that supports your answer because it's not really a theorem. We know it's a rhombus, and by definition of a rhombus, all four sides are congruent. So um, this is just the definition of a rhombus. I'm going to use the fact that all the sides are congruent. So that means that I can set 9x minus 11 equal to 4x plus 7. So it's going to give me... 5x equals 18, so x equals 18 over 5. So then I've got to plug it in. I can plug it into either one because I can't find vt directly. I think that we probably mo rather multiply by 4 than by 9, so we'll go with that, but it doesn't really matter. So I'm going to do 4 times 18 over 5 plus 7. So this is a fraction, so we must freak out, right? No, you're not going to freak out. We're going to do 4 times 18. We can really do 4 times 20, which was 80. And then you subtract 2 4s, which is 8. So that's going to leave you with 72 over 5 plus 7. Now I've got to add fractions, so you need to freak out. No, you do not need to freak out. You need a common denominator. Do not just add 7 to 72. Try and make my head explode. Got to get a common denominator. Common denominator would be 5. So... 5 on the bottom, 5 times 7 is 35. Then I would add those two together. And 70 plus 30 is 100. 2 plus 5 is 7. So I get 107 over 5. Cannot reduce that. That is the length of the T. Because it is the length of ST, technically, but then all four sides are congruent, and we can find it that way just fine. All right, next one. This says, RSTV is a rhombus. So we know it's a rhombus. We want to find the measure of the angle and state our theorem that supports our answer. Well, we're going to have a couple of different WSR. So let's make sure I know which one I'm looking for. WSR, looking for this angle right here. Well, um, the two angles I have labeled, I can't set them equal to each other because they're not congruent. Um, I can't add things up and set them equal to 180 because in this triangle here, I don't know this angle. Um, what I do know is that if it's a rhombus, then think about what that tells you about the diagonals. They do bisect each other because it is a parallelogram, but they are perpendicular because it's a rhombus, which means that I can say that 2y plus 10 equals 90. And that's legal because if it is a rhombus, then the diagonals bisect each other. So that means that 2y equals 80, which means that y equals 40. So if y equals 40, then I can plug that in over here, and I get 40 plus 2, which gives me 42 degrees for this angle right here. That's not the one that I really want. I want this angle here. So think about what you know about these. Remember, the these angles are congruent because it's a parallelogram. But for a rhombus, the diagonals are perpendicular and they bisect opposite angles, which means these two things are congruent. So the angle that I'm looking for, which is the measure of angle WSR, that is 42 degrees. And my reason is, if it is a rhombus, then the diagonals bisect opposite angles.
Okay, next one. Example three. It says, show that the diagonals of a square, of square ABCD, are congruent, perpendicular, bisectors of each other. This is a show. So we know what should be happening. We just got to make it happen. And step one tells us, show that line segment AC and line segment BD are congruent. In order to do that, I've got to use distance. So my distance formula is square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1, oh, whoops, y2, the two should be down there, sorry about that, y2 minus y1 squared. So we'll start with AC. So for the length of AC, that means x2 minus x1, that would be 2 minus a negative 1, squared plus y2 which is 7 minus y1 which is 0 squared. So 2 minus a negative 1 is 3. So 3 squared plus 7 squared. It's going to give me the square root of 9 plus 49. Which means I get the square root of 58. Not a perfect square, so I've got to try to simplify that. It's going to give me 2 and 29, both of which are prime numbers, so I can't do anything with it. So the length of AC equals the square root of 58. Okay, there's the first part of that. So then i got to do BD. So the length of BD equals square root. This is going to be x2, which is 4, minus x1, which is a negative 3 squared plus y2 which is 2 minus y1 which is 5 squared. So this gives me the square root of 7 squared plus negative 3 squared. Square root of 49 plus 9 which means that BD is also the square root of 58. Oops, BD, D which again should be no big shock because we know what we're trying to show here. Now, that doesn't show that they are congruent. We show that their values are equal. So we've got to take that a little bit farther. We need to say that the length of AC equals the length of BD. That is the substitution property of equality. Then I can say that AC is congruent to BD, and that is the definition of congruent segments. Okay, so there, bam, show that they're congruent. So now move on to step two. So show that AC and BD are perpendicular. Okay, so how do I do that? I don't really know how to make the angle on this, but what we have done with perpendicular is their slopes. If I want to show that they're perpendicular, I can find the slope of each one of them. And so I will start with line segment AC. It is delta Y over delta X. So that means I'm going to get 7 minus 0 over 2 minus a negative 1, which is going to give me 7 over 3. By itself, doesn't mean anything. So then I find the slope of BD, and that is going to be 2 minus 5 over 4 minus a negative 3. That's going to give me a negative 3 over 7. There are my two slopes. Is that what I would expect to get for perpendicular slopes? Absolutely. They are negative reciprocals of each other. So now we can say that line segment AC is perpendicular to line segment BD based on what we found over here. So bam, show that they are perpendicular. So now it says to show that they sorry. Show that they bisect each other. You can completely ignore this right here that says definition of a parallelogram. I do not know how that guy snuck in there. 
but that has nothing to do with what we're doing right this second. So we want to show that they bisect each other. So just like we did yesterday, to show that something bisects each other, it's good to show their midpoints. All right, so to find the midpoint of AC, you'll have to look at your own picture because you can't see it anymore. You're going to get negative 1 plus 2 over 2 and 0 plus 7 over 2. It gives you 1 half, 7 halves. By itself doesn't mean anything, so we got to find BD. So that's negative 3 plus 4 over 2 and 5 plus 2 over 2, which again gives you 1 half, 7 halves, which you expect to get. I mean, you know you're going to get the same thing, but you're showing this, so you have to actually show that it's happening. And this doesn't scream bisecting. That just shows that they have the same midpoints. So you have to explain. We can say AC and BD have the same midpoint. So they bisect each other. And that is showing that. So what we've shown is that these segments in here are perpendicular bisectors of each other, which means that it's a square, which we already knew. Okay, that's it. So go ahead and glue this in and get started on your homework.